right, let's welcome to the show from FramingPaterno.com, John Ziegler. Hello, John. How are you today? I'm doing well, Kevin. Always good to talk to you. And, uh, you know, I, I know if I, if I wait a month, you'll be in a new place to talk to you. So it's always fun. <laughs> you know what I say, John? Lou Holtz taught me this a long time ago when I asked him, why do you move so much on the sideline when he was coaching at Minnesota? And he said, it's harder to hit a moving target. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I know that. That's why I've lived in 12 different cities myself. <laughs> Hey, these uh, settlements in the Sandusky case are starting to come down the pike. And um, a couple of the victims say they have already reached settlements. Penn State has set aside $60 million for settlements in some 30 claims. What is your take? Wow. Um, well, Kevin, you know, look, for people who don't know the details of this case um, or may not think that they care about it, I, I hope they listen carefully to what we're about to say because – Regardless of what you think of Penn State or Joe Paterno or Jerry Sandusky or any of this, uh, if you care at all about the truth, if you care all about justice or what kind of society we're going to live in, you ought to be outraged by the way that Penn State is handling these settlements. Uh, now, I realize that the news media, which has been the biggest problem in this entire case from day one, thinks that there's nothing weird, fishy, or problematic going on because they won't tell you the details. But I will tell you the details. And there have been four major victims so far that have been in the news this week about getting settlements. And frankly, Kevin, I actually think that Penn State may have strategically decided to settle the most absurd cases first. <laughs> because, because these four, these four, and I'd like to go through all four of them with you, because they, they're really hilarious if it wasn't so serious how bad each of these four situations are. So, you know, here's the bottom line. And for people who've never heard me before, I'm the guy who interviewed Jerry Sandusky in prison. I don't, I don't believe in conspiracies. Framing Paterno is figurative. It's, it's not literal. I believe Jerry Sandusky is a pedophile, although I think that the nature of his pedophilia has been misunderstood, and then he may have been convicted of some things that he didn't actually do. And I absolutely know that Penn State and Jerry Paterno had no knowledge or culpability in his crimes. Now, with that being said, let's go through a couple of these victims, because these are amazing, Kevin. This and, is really and, 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 you know, and John, before you do, I want to let everybody know that this is where you'll hear the truth because there's no sugarcoating this. Everybody else is afraid of this case. They're afraid yep. to say what you're saying. They're afraid to say what I'm saying, that these victims, while some of them truly deserve compensation, this, this uh, media frenzy fueled the fire when this trial took place. Absolutely. I mean, this is really the classic snowball down a mountain where no one wants to no, no one is as dumb as you and I to get in front of this snowball. Uh, and, and the media has perpetrated it. And now I mean, we're even in a situation where members of the Penn State Board of Trustees, six of whom were elected on a pro Joe Paterno plank, have even voted in favor of these settlements because they're afraid. Everyone is so afraid. The cowardice in this case is startling. Everyone is so afraid to be misperceived as being against the victims or being in favor or defending Jerry Sandusky. That's not what this is about. This is about the truth. And here's the truth, as you said, that no one else is going to tell you. First guy who made his settlement was victim number five. Now, if you listen to the media story, they tell you that victim number five got paid more money than the other victims because his allegation occurred after the Mike McQuarrie episode. And therefore, because it allegedly occurred in August of 2001, that means that Penn State had the ability to stop Sandusky before then, and therefore Penn State is more culpable, and therefore he gets more money. Now, that sounds fairly logical, right, if you don't know any of the facts, right. except, except here's the problem. Number one problem, victim number five originally testified at the grand jury that that did not occur in 2001. It occurred in 1998, okay? That's a huge difference. Why did the date get changed? The date got changed to trial. I believe the evidence indicates, and it's very clear when you look at the documentary evidence that's been put together by Ray Blehar, who, who uh, contributes to FramingPaterno.com, and that is that the attorney for victim five realized full well that a 2001 allegation was going to be worth a hell of a lot more than a 1998 allegation. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, and here's how I know that date is false. I 
talk to Jerry Sandusky specifically about this very issue, about how he reacted to Penn State coming to him after the McCreary episode, taking away his keys, telling him no more kids on campus. Jerry Sandusky might be the worst person in the world. He's not an imbecile, okay? He got it. He got the message. He never brought another kid on campus, and he certainly never showered with another kid on campus. Dottie Sandusky and Jerry have both told me very recently they are 1,000% positive the victim number five never stepped foot in the Lash building, wouldn't know where to find the Lash building if, they, if he had a map. And the reality is that, by the way, his allegation that he's getting paid millions of dollars, well, probably $3 million or thereabouts, because he got more money, this is his allegation. His allegation is that he was forced to take a shower with Sandusky. Not that he got raped, not that he had oral sex, but he was forced to take a shower. And oh, by the way, Kevin, the cherry on the top of this insane Sunday, there was one allegation at Sandusky's trial where the jury decided, apparently, that the victim who testified was not credible. Guess which one that was? Victim number five. Victim number five. <laughs> I mean, this, so, so if you look at the details of this, this is insane. And it, it, I believe the kid probably took a shower with Jerry Sandusky. Logic would dictate that his first version of the story under oath was true. And that was in 1998, which, by the way, makes sense because in 1998, Jerry, in his stupid, thick brain, didn't think there was anything wrong with showering with kids. Okay? <laughs> because at that point, he hadn't had the McQuarrie episode yet. He hadn't been talked to by Penn State, and he hadn't been talked to by the law enforcement officials who investigated the 1998 episode in May of that year and decided it was not criminal and unfounded. So that makes perfect sense. That was victim number five, okay? So he was the first one. Then we have the issue of Matt Sandusky, okay? This, is, Sandusky, this, this might be my favorite, by the way. This is amazing. Okay, so Matt Sandusky, who has gotten a huge amount of publicity and sympathy, Matt Sandusky, from everything I have heard from his own family members, is a horrendous human being. Now, he might be a horrendous human being because he's had a lot of horrific things happen in his life, having nothing to do with Jerry Sandusky. He was adopted by the Sanduskys many years ago. When the allegations against Jerry first came forward, Matt Sandusky was his biggest supporter. As a matter of fact, one of the other victims, which I'll get to in a minute, but victim number two actually referenced Matt Sandusky in letters to the editor that he wrote supporting Jerry. This was before the arrest, before this really became a national story. It was really only a local story because Sarah Gannon had written an article in March of 2011 on this issue. So he's a supporter of Jerry, right? The, the trial starts. And on the day the first victim takes the stand, the family goes back to the house, and there is Matt Sandusky, and five other members of the Sandusky family. And Matt Sandusky says to the, the, the assembled group, you know, I could lie just like that victim who took the stand today, and I could make a lot of money doing it. And everyone was like, what? What, is, what the heck is going on here? Well, then suddenly, a couple weeks later, when the trial is just about to end, Matt Sandusky suddenly, using... Repressed memory therapy, which is a completely debunked theory, okay? It's not even allowed in many courtrooms. Decides suddenly, after all these years, that he remembers that when he was 8 to 10 years old, Jerry, one time, may have kissed him on the stomach and may have grazed his penis with his hand during the episode. <laughs> may have. This May have, may have. He's not even 100 percent sure because this is repressed memory therapy. By the way, forget it, even that repressed memory therapy is bunk. This kid has had so many horrific things in his life. This is the memory he represses: <laughs> being kissed on the stomach as an eight-year-old. It, it makes no sense, but it gets reported that Matt Sandusky is now a victim, and because of the Mike McQuarrie episode, everybody thinks that means, oh my God, he got raped in a shower. Well, no, that's not the allegation. So now Matt Sadesky, who has absolutely nothing to do with Penn State, Penn State had no knowledge Matt Sandusky was ever even theoretically a victim. Now suddenly, their Penn State is about to pay Matt Sandusky, a horrible person, who, by the way, I forgot to tell you, testified 
that Jerry Sandusky never did anything to him sexually, so he perjured himself. He perjures himself. I believe he then lies in the middle of the trial, and he gets paid by Penn State? It's only, and, and we're talking. Remember, let's go back to the first thing you said about this: that he came home to the Sandusky house after the first day of trial and told everyone present, "I could lie like that and get a lot of money." So then he goes out and does that, and no one bats an eye. I should have been in that area at that time and said, "Oh, by the way, Jerry Sandusky did this to me too." Well, I've made a lot of mistakes in this quest for the truth that I've been on, uh, you know, through the website and the film and the book that I put out, The Betrayal of Joe Paterno. I've made a ton of mistakes. My biggest mistake may have been, Kevin, to not have you and me, uh, you know, claim to be Sandusky victims, uh, you know, because I went to a Temple Penn State football game back in, I think, 1981 or something. I kind of remember Jerry looking at me funny. So, you know, I think think that um, there's a good chance uh, that, you know, and I mean it's only half facetiously, by the way, because I think there's a darn good chance that you know, one of our claims would have been found to be credible. Um, you know, this is how absurd this has gotten. And, and it's not because, you see, people will perceive what we're saying as we're being insensitive to the victims. Sure. No. Well, that, well, that's how people are. They're going to say that, but they don't know any. These are the people that say that don't know one thing about this case. No, they, they don't. But and, and by the way. To me, as soon as you, you, the other side says that, you're not allowed to say that. Then I know, oh, so you have no facts. I mean, <laughs> so the only way you can win this argument is if I'm disarmed and I'm not allowed to tell you what the facts are because it's politically incorrect. You're telling me, therefore, that you have no case. Uh, and and the, the reality is, is this not being insensitive to the victims. This is simply trying to figure out what really happened here. Who is really at fault? And for Penn State to do what they're doing, you now some might tell you, well, wait a minute, John. You know, if this went to court, you know, public opinion and the media being what it is, they'll be crucified all over again and they'll have to pay more money. First of all, I don't believe that's true. Nobody gets paid two to three million dollars for being forced to take a shower with somebody. In the history of the world, would somebody <laughs> please show me the court case where someone sued a university because a former employee forced them to take a shower and they got three million dollars for that? I mean, in it's, a million years, it's absurd. That, it's, it's it's ridiculous. And and by, and by the way, even if it's not ridiculous. Whatever happened to the truth, whatever happened to justice, whatever happened to actually fighting for what is actually right and wrong. And and this is I want to speak directly to the Penn State alums and supporters of Joe Paterno who listen to you. And I know that they do, because this is not just a theoretical or philosophical problem I have. There is a huge practical problem here that unfortunately a lot of people don't seem to be able to do the math on because i believe this is the final nail in the historical coffin of joe paterno at penn state because there is no path no path now to any legitimate exoneration of him at penn state because here's why Let's say 10 years from now, 20 years from now, Penn State decides, you know what, uh, we've got enough board of trustees members who, who are gone, from, who fired him. There's enough new ones who are supportive of him. We're going to put up a, some sort of a motion to bring back the statue or do some, you know, name the field after him, whatever it is, right? Well, first of all, by that point, a lot of our people are going to be dead. A lot of their people who don't know any better, the stupid young people, you know, they're going to be <laughs> older and more in power. But more importantly than that, they're going to be the other side is going to be able to say, "Well, wait a minute. The university paid sixty million dollars acknowledging culpability in the crimes that Joe Paterno oversaw, essentially admitting guilt. That's a game set match. You can't get around that. It's over. It's checkmate." John, doesn't so, it doesn't it blow you away that Penn State has succumbed to these settlements so quickly without any? Look, look. When when I, if if I if there's a criminal case against jo, Jerry Sandusky and he's found guilty in many instances, uh, forty some odd instances, that doesn't necessarily mean that the civil cases are going to be won. But Penn State has decided they're all winners. It's Christmas time. Well, and it's even worse than that. And this gets me to the second practical point, Kevin, and that is. 
There's a, a trial involving Jim Curley, Gary Schultz, and Graham Spanier, the former Penn State administrators, over the issue of perjury and not reporting and conspiracy and all that kind of stuff, which I think are completely bogus charges, and I think a fair trial will show that to be the case. How prejudicial is it to their chances of justice to have the, the jury pool bombarded in the months leading up to their selection. Of course, those, the potential jurors don't even know who they are yet, so they're not sequestered or anything like that. They, they're reading and they're seeing that Penn State is taking full responsibility for 30 odd victims to the tune of $60 million, and that's why that date on victim five is so incredibly important. And I, I spoke to the Grand Spaniard about this this week. The reality is, Penn State, I believe, is setting those former administrators up because they went out of their way to publicize the fact that that August 2001 date made sure that uh, victim number five got more money. Well, why is that important? That's important to the Curley and Schultz and Spanier trial because it shows that they failed in warning Sandusky. But that date is bogus. It is a bogus date chosen for political purposes by the prosecution and for money purposes by the lawyer of victim five. It didn't happen in August of 2001. But that they're setting Curley, Schultz, and Spanier up, and I believe their chances at a fair trial have been greatly diminished by what's happened this week. I couldn't agree with you more. This is unconscionable behavior on the part of Penn State's administration to settle these cases prior to these criminal trials. Uh, anyone with a functioning brain can see the prejudicial value of that against these three guys. And why they would do that, and I know that they don't care about the fate of those three, but why they would do that with any kind of ethical sense of morals is beyond me. And, and to me, it's shameful conduct once again on the part of the administration at Penn State, which is setting records for shameful conduct. Well, you, you said it very well. Um, and, and actually, we haven't even gotten through all of them. There's two other victims, victim number two and victim number 10, whose stories I think are important to tell. Uh, I don't know if we have, do we have time to do that in this segment or do you want to go for the next, nope. next segment? No, go right ahead. Okay, well, so victim victim number two, as you know, is is to the key of the whole case to me, and and this goes to the issue of Joe Paterno's uh, lack of guilt, in my opinion. I know you you agree with me on this. This is the Mike McQuarrie episode. People really need to know the true story of victim number two, and I've written extensively about this at the website FramingPaterno.com. It's in the book, The Betrayal of Joe Paterno, chapter number two, among other places. We have documents related to victim number two, which I waved on the Today Show and on Piers Morgan that nobody else has. Here's the real story of this victim who is about to get millions of dollars, and you can Tell me, Kevin, how this makes any damn sense. In, in May of 2011, victim two writes two letters to the editor and a letter to the attorney general of the state of Pennsylvania at that time, supporting Jerry Sandusky in his own name. He does this as a 24-year-old married sergeant in the Marine Corps, okay? He, he, he makes himself a public figure on this case supporting Sandusky, saying that he's the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Then in September of that year, he is asked to do a police interview, I believe, because of the letters to the editor. He does does that interview after asking Jerry Sandusky, should I come forward? There's a voicemail message of Jerry Sandusky saying, go ahead, come forward. We've got nothing really to hide here. <laughs> I knew immediately when I heard that voicemail message. Obviously, this was a police interview because the story hadn't hit nationally as of yet. Sure enough, there is a record of a police interview that, that victim number two gave in September of that year before Sandusky was arrested, saying nothing happened. And by the way, Kevin, not only does he say nothing happened, he ends the interview by, by saying to the investigators, you're trying to get me to lie. I will never say anything bad about Jerry Sandusky. That's a quote. That's from September of 2011. Then on November 9th of 2011, the day Joe Paterno was fired, that very same 24-year-old comes into the office of Joe Amendola, Sandusky's defense attorney, and he gives a written state or verbal statement, which is written down by a former FBI, a former an FBI trained former police officer, who who takes down the statement. The statement is as clear cut as you could possibly be. Nothing happened with Jerry. I was the boy in the shower in the McQuarrie episode. Mike McQuarrie is lying. I don't understand what this is all about. Then, 
He, picked, he gets an attorney by the name of Andrew Shubin. Andrew Shubin just happens to be the guy who, number one, put up an advertisement for Sandusky victims on his website. <laughs> number two, just happens to be the guy who victim two's mom worked for as a secretary. Number three, Andrew Shubin just happens to be the guy who represented victim two earlier that year in a DUI case. Gee, what a shocker that suddenly, <laughs> suddenly... Victim two decides he's a victim. But does that mean he wasn't telling the truth about what he, what didn't happen in the three episodes? Yeah, yeah so you do th which statement was true? Well, well, but here, here's how we know, Kevin, because as you remember, I went on a Today Show. That's right. And what did Matt La and what did Matt Lauer hit me with? Matt Lauer hit me with a statement from his attorney. This was uh, this was in March of March 25th of this year. Okay, way after he's become a victim, way after the trials, which by the way he never testified at. Gee, I wonder why. And and what happens in that statement? What didn't that statement from the lawyer on the Today Show have? It had not one mention, not one mention of the McQuarrie episode, not one mention of our uh, our our client believes he was molested or abused in that episode. Nothing which, as you know, is a telltale sign he has not changed his story. Now, if he has changed his story, and if he comes forward and in, in incredible fashion explains why he told the original story and why he switched and, and what really did happen, and if it somehow dovetails with Mike McCreary, you know what, Kevin, I will say, fine, I'm wrong. I'll take down FramingPaterno.com, but at least at that point we will have proven that something actually happened, <laughs> that there's... So there's actually something to base all of this on, but currently there isn't, because if victim two is telling the truth, that means McQuarrie is, I don't even, you don't even have to say he's lying, I think McQuarrie changed his mind when, when urged to do so by investigators about what he saw 10 years earlier. So if that didn't happen, the entire case against Joe Paterno and Penn State falls apart, and yet... Despite the fact that victim two has never testified, despite all of his public statements, the fact that he's a public figure on this, the, the, and, and the fact that he has never told a story that contradicts the story that I have on my website, despite all that, and the fact that the media doesn't even con consider him to be a real victim, that's really, that's the richest part of this whole thing, Kevin, is that victim two gets to be a victim when it helps him, but he's not a victim when it hurts him. Because <laughs> the media has decided, well, we don't want to talk about the, the public statements that he has made on this issue because they're inconvenient to our narrative. But if he's asking for money, then he's a legitimate victim. I mean, that's the insane world we're living in here. So despite all that, he's going to get millions of dollars. Now, will he now tell his story? I'll be very interested in that because victim 10 just got his check and he's now told his story, which is another. He's the fourth of these insane situations where he has no, I believe, legitimate claim uh, to money, especially not from Penn State. And so this whole thing is it's, it's absolutely insane making. I, 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 don't, I don't know how anybody who knows all these facts cannot see it clearly. And I'm, I'm also equally baffled how I haven't lost my mind being one of the only people who was willing to say this because it's so obviously true. Why do you suppose that a guy who, who wasn't even – his case wasn't even uh, resulting in a conviction of, of Sandusky, Penn State is so quick to want to give money to? Well, you know, you just you brought up you know so many elements of the victim two situation that I actually forgot that one. Yes, it is important to point out that the rape allegation, which was in, I refer to it as a war crime, a war crime committed by the prosecution in that grand jury presentment and perpetrated by the media, that somehow Mike McQuarrie saw a rape and told Joe Paterno about it. That's a lie. That was a war crime in the middle of a battle. We now know that that never happened. Nothing close to that occurred. In fact, I don't believe anything sexually even happened happened in that particular episode. But the jury, the hanging jury in the Jerry Sandusky uh, trial, in fact, decided that the worst allegation, the rape allegation, did not happen. They declared Jerry Sandusky to be not guilty on that. But, you know, because there were lesser charges where he was found guilty on that, even though victim two didn't testify. See, this is, this is what's so crazy. If, if you really did get abused, right? Let's do the math on this, Kevin. Just be human being. Just, do a, just think of this as a regular human being. 
if you were really abused, okay, and you lied about it for the reason you're protecting Jason Dusty, you don't want to make you abused, I get that. That's fine. But now, now you go to, to an attorney who says, okay, we can make you some money on this. Um, you are, in fact, the victim. This happened before Jerry's trial. Why don't you testify? The guy who raped you in a shower, and you're going to let him go on trial, and, you're, and you don't care enough about justice that you're going to actually testify under oath to what happened? Does, does anybody really believe that? And then, and then 15 minutes after the trial ends, your lawyer comes up with a statement, oh, by the way, we represent victim two, and we're suing <laughs> Penn State. I mean, what? If that doesn't make any rational person look at your motives and question them, then, then you haven't been living, because that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. And the reason it doesn't make any sense, what I firmly believe happened here, is that Andrew Shubin, this unscrupulous attorney, convinced victim two that he was a victim of Jerry Sandusky, but not that he was raped. You follow me? Yeah. In other words, just by simply by virtue of having showered with him and having, you know, Jerry touched his leg one time in a way that made him feel uncomfortable, which he says in his statement to Amendola's attorney, that's all you need. That's all you need to be a victim in this case right. because no one's going to ask any questions and Penn State's going to bring out the checkbook. So, you, you know, you, you, you're out of the Marines. you got two DUIs, which victim two has. You know, you don't have a job. You're married. What are you going to do? You got free money. You get some free, free money, money. For, free for Christmas time at Penn State. Okay, now how about the fourth one? So victim 10. Victim 10 is a real rich one, okay? Victim 10 just did an interview with uh, the ABC affiliate in Philadelphia today. All right, now here's the story on Victim 10. This is quite amazing. Victim 10 claims that for three years in the late 1990s, he was abused badly by Jerry Sandusky and that there were apparently some sex acts involved, although he's a little bit vague about that. But, okay, I'll, I'll give him whatever you want, okay? He's, he's alleging sex acts. But, but there's a problem. He never came forward. He didn't come forward until after, you know, this three-year grand jury investigation, which was written about in the newspaper. Uh, he never comes forward until after the crap hits the fan, and it's clear that Penn State is going to, you know, open the checkbook, and everybody knows Jerry's guilty. So he comes forward, and he testifies at trial. And here's what he, t he testifies, that the, the, the Jerry abused him in a silver convertible. Now, there's just a pro only one of many problems here. The Sandeskis have never owned a silver convertible. They've never owned anything close to a silver convertible. I spoke to Dottie this morning. She says in the early 80s, they, earned, they owned a car that was silver, but it wasn't even close to a convertible. It didn't even have a sunroof. <laughs> so, so there's a problem there. Number two, this guy is a drug addict who spent several years in prison <laughs> for numerous crimes that were not just using drugs, okay? And he gets, he, he has no, there's absolutely no connection to Penn State at all in this particular situation. This was before the McQuarrie episode, his allegations. So why Penn State is paying him, I have no idea. And then he gets to do this interview on ABC in Philadelphia, and nothing that I just told you got mentioned, and he gets to be silhouetted, so no one sees his face, no one knows his name, and here's the kicker. Now, you can believe what you want to believe about their credibility. I believe Dottie Sandusky to be a very credible person. She's never lied to me. She's been incredibly open. She has a huge incentive to throw Jerry under the bus and has not done so. Both Dottie and Jerry swear to me they don't even know who victim 10 is. In other words, when he showed up at trial, they didn't even recognize him. They had no idea of who his identity was. I mean, they, they, they were told his name, but they never met him before. This guy, I believe, I mean, who knows for sure? But when you look at his drug record, his prison record, his false testimony, Jerry and Dottie insisting. By the way, that's the only victim that they've said they don't know. The other, the other seven that testified, they, they fully they acknowledge they know. How many, so, victim, how many victims did Jerry Sandusky admit to you, John, that he had molested? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Because obviously it gets to your definition of molestation. Right. I believe that Jerry. I believe that Jerry did admit to me 
that he molested children by the legal definition. I don't think he understood what the legal definition was. In other words, I think that the heart of this entire situation, Kevin, gets down to Jerry Zandusky was a master at creating plausible deniability through his persona, through his grooming of the entire town, as Franco Harris likes to say, uh, through, through the fact that he was running this charity, the Second Mile, through his celebrity. He knew, in fact, when he said to me, and this is really important, I hope we have time for just a second here. Jim Clemente, the paternal family sex crimes expert, former FBI guy who's been on television a lot, he wrote part of the Paterno Report. He and I discussed what I was going to do with the Sandusky interview for hours and hours and hours. And I said to Jim, Jim, how do I get Jerry to confess? Because at this time I was totally convinced Jerry was completely guilty because I hadn't met him yet. And, and Jim tells me exactly how to do it. So I go word for word what Jim tells me what to do. And Jerry doesn't really confess, except, and I laid it on thick, Kevin. I mean, I, I, I knocked it out of the ballpark. People can read this at our website, FramingPaterno.com. I have the transcript of the entire interview up there. In fact, I think that audio is even in, on the website. And I lay it on thick. And he doesn't confess, but what he says to me is, I may have tested boundaries. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what? What? You, who, what, what male says I may have tested boundaries <laughs> yeah. with, with teenage boys, right? That, to me, was Jerry Sandusky acknowledging, you know what? I did go too far. Right. I have a physical compulsion with these kids. But he kept telling me time and time again, I'm not the monster they say I am. There were exaggerations. I never violated these boys. I never harmed these boys. In his mind, I believe, Kevin, I could be wrong. But in, in his mind, I believe that Jerry is, in fact, a pedophile with a compulsion to, to be sexual with these boys. But that he thinks, in his mind, he actually controlled it. I believe the best analogy I can come up with is I think that Jerry was almost like a married man in a strip club, where there are the rules and then there's what you get away with, right? And this is incredibly perverse, and I can understand why people would be horrendously offended by all of this. But the reality is that I think that those lines that were, in fact, crossed became, once this snowball went down the mountain, became something completely different and far worse than it actually was. And that's why Jerry took a lie detector test, and it was inconclusive. And it is my understanding that the lie detector test, he passed on the, on the sex acts, and he, and he did not pass on what we might consider to be the grooming or the or the, the testing of boundaries issues. And I believe that's the most sensible explanation for what really happened here because it explains everything. It explains how Penn State reacted. It explains how law enforcement reacted. It explains why none of the victims ever came forward because most of them didn't know they were being abused. I mean, come on, people. It, it, it's, un, it's unbelievable stuff, and the settlements are even more remarkable. And uh, we've got to run, John, but spectacular stuff as always. Um, great, great job of breaking down these four settlements that we know of so far. And uh, everyone in State College should be up in arms at this administration. Number one, for uh, settling cases without having a civil case. And number two, the timing of it when three men's lives are at stake in criminal trials and they are prejudicing these trials. And if I were their attorneys, I would have a change of venue on the table of motion for that as soon as the sun came up. Kevin, thanks so much for giving me the time to tell the truth here, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again. Thanks, Sean. That's Bye. Sean Ziegler from FramingPaterno.com. Always welcome on the show and always does a great job. Hey, if you're a... Uh